So today's sermon, as we head into this new school year, it's appropriate enough, and it comes from a passage from Jesus in the Sermon on the Level, which we've been working our way through the last several Sundays. The sermon title today is Like Teacher, Like Student. Like Teacher, Like Student. And we're going to, in a few minutes, be reading through the entire sermon on the level that Jesus gives. It's recorded in Luke chapter 6. We've worked our way through most of this sermon now. And my plan is this Sunday and next Sunday to read through the whole thing as we focus a little bit on some of the closeout passages of the Sermon on the Level. But I want to go ahead and give you the heads up. Your anchor verse for today, from which the sermon title is drawn, is Luke chapter 6, verse 40, in which Jesus says, A disciple is not above the teacher, but everyone fully trained or who is fully trained will be like his teacher. A disciple is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like the teacher. So, like teacher, like student. As an introduction today, I want to say this and ask you to reflect on this. You know, we tend to acquire and to echo and to replicate the best traits and the worst traits of our most influential teachers. Think about the people who in your life have been your key anchors, the people that you've learned from and followed. The proverb I've just quoted from Jesus is not just a sentimental reminiscence though. It's an alarm note, a prophetic alarm from Jesus that we are supposed to be wise about the teachers we follow. Because, like teacher, like student. Parents, this is a, an alarm warning prophetically for you too. I want to be very clear as we head into a new school season especially. Be wise about the teachers we choose and prioritize for our children, for our teenagers, and for our college students. Why? Because, as the proverb tells us, Students will tend to absorb and mimic their teachers' thinking, personalities, attitudes, behavior, and results. Now, Jesus pairs this particular proverb or proverbial saying that I've mentioned together with a parable about the perils of people following blind leaders, the blind following the blind, a little parabolic saying from Jesus. And then he actually follows this, Jesus does, with a series of other parables as he closes out this radically powerful message that he has in the Sermon on the Level. In the sermon, Jesus, on the one side, blesses and distinguishes kingdom of God people, kingdom of God people, people who are actually children of our Father in heaven born again by the Holy Spirit. Jesus distinguishes those kind of folks from others who are would-be disciples and supposedly religious people who are actually not children of God, who are not born of the Spirit, who are still doing things their way. So Jesus distinguishes people he calls his own, the children of the Father, from people who claim to be religious and Christian but don't live by the Spirit and do not live effectuating the Word of God. So today, we're going to read through the entire Sermon on the Level, as I mentioned. But remember, though, our anchor verse is, A disciple is not above the teacher, and everyone, when fully trained, will be like the teacher. Now, I've also included, to start with, a related passage from the prophet Hosea. From Hosea chapter 4, verse 9, in which uh, the Lord God employs a proverbial saying, like people, like priest. Did you hear that? Like people, like priest. Uh, and brings a prophetic judgment. So now I invite you to hear now God's word as I read through Hosea 4, verse 9, but then the entire sermon on the level. Listen, I'm also going to mark off for you as we make our way through. Sometimes, just like in the Old Testament, by the way, just like in the Shema and the rest of Deuteronomy, like I've been studying in Sunday school, Jesus shifts from second person plural, y'all, to second person singular, you, you specifically. 
So I'll, I'll just highlight that as we move through. Hosea chapter 4, verse 9. Hear now God's word. The Lord says, And it shall be like people, like priests. I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. And then to the Sermon on the Level. Luke chapter 6, picking up at verse 20 with the introduction. And he, Jesus, lifted his eyes on his disciples. Remember, there's a massive crowd of people who've come for the great miracle worker and teacher. Massive crowd. But Jesus specifically lifts his eyes on his disciples, including those who would be his disciples, and said, Blessed are you. The yous are plural here. Blessed are you who are the poor, because yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are the hungry now because you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who are the weeping now, because you shall laugh. Blessed are you, y'all, when people hate you, exclude you, exclude y'all, revile you. And now this is specifically singular, because we're talking about the name of Jesus, and spurn your name, in other words, your name being identified with me, as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice, y'all, and be glad and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, because so their fathers treated the prophets the same. But woe to y'all. You, plural, continues here. Woe to you who are rich, because you have received your comfort. Woe to you all who are full now, because you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, because you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you. When all people speak well of you all, um, because so their fathers treated the false prophets the same. Continuing with plural, but I say to you, those who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. Now to singular. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold the tunic or the shirt either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from one who takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Now pull back to plural to the whole kingdom people uh, collectively. And as you wish that others would do to you, do them likewise. If you love those who love you, what credit, literally, Karen, the word here is Karen, what grace is that to you? For even the sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit, what grace is that to you? For even the sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit, what grace is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners and get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good to them and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward, the Greek here literally is wages, your reward, your wages will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind person lead a blind person? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Now, back to singular. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me cast out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite, cast out first the log from your own eye, and then you will see clearly the speck in your brother's eye to cast out. Four, there is no good tree producing rotten fruit, nor again a bad or rotten tree producing good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For they do not gather figs from thorn bushes, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. 
the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil stored in him produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Plural. Why do you all call me Lord, Lord, and do not know, do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you whom he, singular, is like. He is like the person building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the bedrock. And when a flood came, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them, in other words, my words, is like a person who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And the torrent burst against it and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So, Hosea, chapter 4, verse 9. The Lord takes a proverbial saying, like people, like priest, and brings a prophetic judgment. The Lord is actually bringing one of his covenant lawsuits, a reeb against uh, Israel, against the people. He says this, and it shall be like people, like priests. So question, if you like to be philosophical, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Hmm? You know, and you could say, well, which, which is it? Sinful people corrupting priest or priest leading the people astray? Sinful people wanting a golden calf or Aaron giving them the golden calf? Which comes first? And who, who's principally culpable? And God says, no matter. They're both going to condemnation. People and priest, priest and people follow one another into the same judgment. So here's the reality, based on what we just heard from God's word, Old Testament and New Testament. Someone will be your primary teacher. Someone will be your primary teacher, your most influential teacher, the teacher, I might call him or her. Who is your the teacher right now? Who's it going to be this year? Parents? Someone will be the primary, most influential teacher. This doesn't necessarily have to be a person who has a title of teacher. You all understand this, right? Someone will be the teacher for your children, for your teenager, for your college student. The teacher for them. The teacher for who you are, what you value, what you're going to become, what you fear, what you desire. You, modeling and directing your relationships with others. Modeling and directing your relationship with your church. Modeling your relationship with God, your church, your morality, your spirituality, your emotionality. Now, let's just be honest, parents. I, I know this coach or this person or this big brother or big sister figure may be able to teach your boy how to mix in a slider and an effective slider, a biting slider with a fastball. And I understand to get to the next level of competitive baseball, he needs that a lot. If baseball is your thing and his baseball is the be all end all and you really think baseball is gonna determine his eternal destination. But let me just tell you, if this coach, if this coach who teaches, but she's the best with backflips, my daughter will be the best cheerleader ever. I, I, my, my soccer player will be the best. My musician will be the best. Who is this person that you're investing all this money and your kids time into? Where are they with God and what are their values? I, I'm telling you, you better think about this and you better pray about this a lot. There are a lot of good, really good pitchers who, who are not upstairs in the age to come. There are a lot of people who can do really, I mean, there were great gymnasts and backflip people in Babylon in the days of the Bible, okay? I'm just telling you, that is not really what matters. So you better think about this, because here's the reality. 
The reality is, and you can follow along with the notes, you need to be filling this in. Let's, let's fill in some blanks here. You will follow your teacher into number one. What? You will follow your teacher in, the answer there is life, and that includes lifestyle and life values, okay? You will follow your teacher in life, in lifestyle. And you will follow your teacher not only in life, but flowing from that into what? What goes in that number two at the beginning? The answer is judgment. That's what God says. You will follow your teacher not only in life, but flowing from the life and the lifestyle you lead into judgment, and flowing from that, the other blank there, eternity. So who's the teacher? What are the priorities? A disciple, Jesus says, will not rise above his or her teacher in life, in judgment, and in eternity. And I don't know about you, but Jesus says everybody's going to, you know, be raised, some to eternal communion with God and some to eternal damnation. I don't know about you, but I want to rise kind of along the lines of the people who are rising to eternal communion. Does that sound good to you? A disciple will not rise above his or her teacher in life, in judgment, or in eternity. Now today, uh, digging in a little bit more on Jesus' Sermon on the Plain, we're going to kind of work back through some of this overview and focus in a little bit as Jesus moves towards the conclusion of the sermon. Next week, we'll go all the way to the end. A disciple will not rise above his teacher, her teacher, in content, character, conduct, consequences, or crisis. And everyone who is fully trained will be like his or her teacher in content, character, conduct, consequences, and crisis. That's what we're going to see Jesus gives us in the Sermon on the Plain. First of all, a disciple will not rise above his or her teacher in content. And everyone fully trained by the teacher will be like the teacher in content. Now, for school purposes, I also throw in another C here, curriculum. Content curriculum. This is what we're talking about. Now, let me tell you this. I have the joy and the opportunity to do pastoral counseling with folks in this church and other people in our community. I've done it in different places over the years. I have the joy and the opportunity to talk with our young people just on a kind of casual basis or serendipitous basis, but also sometimes for specific discussions about, like, you've gone through this program. Let's talk about what you've learned. And let me tell you this, after spending 20 to 30 to 45 minutes with somebody, I can tell you what content has been going into their brains and hearts and life for the last several years, because it's gonna come out. And if I start asking questions about this book and about God, and there's very little there that tells me there's very little content from whatever teachers they are getting taught by about God and about his word. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is not rocket science. But if they can tell me all kinds of things about other information, but don't connect it with a faith basis, then what I can easily infer from that is, so this child, this teenager, or this adult is getting a lot of data in that doesn't connect with God and with his word. They may be able to tell me about backflips. They may be able to tell me about tournaments. They may be able to tell me about who their hero is in the sports world or in the entertainment world or what songs they're listening to, what's on their playlist. But you pretty much get what content is going into somebody. A disciple will not rise above his or her teacher in content, in curriculum, in what information, what values really dominate you. So just think about it. What, what is the world view of your main influencers? What are the ethics? What are the techniques that are taught? What is esteemed and who is esteemed? That's a big one. What is esteemed? Who is esteemed? What are the purposes, goals, and nature of the course that's being taught 
and the means to achieve. Let me remind you, as we've been learning from the Sermon on the Level, Jesus' content is radically different than conventional wisdom or worldly values. It's just totally different. As we've been talking about, Jesus teaches what's called the upside-down kingdom. Blessed are you when you are poor because you're related to me. Blessed are you when you are persecuted and not the most popular kid in school because of me. Your reward's great. But if you're popular with everybody, if all cylinders are firing and man, everything's good in the world, I'm telling you, Jesus says, you are cruising for a serious eternal bruising, not good. I say to you, Jesus says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. This just does not make sense to the worldly person. It just does not. If you love those who love you, what grace, what credit is that to you? For even the sinners love those who love them. Now, here's what's going on. We could call this, this is not really the upside down kingdom, it's the right side up kingdom. Or specifically, the righteousness up kingdom. Don't you want to be part of that, Christian? The righteousness up kingdom? Jesus in the midst of this brings tough messages of harvest principles. You will reap what you sow. The measure you use, it's going to be measured back to you by the Lord in the age to come. But it's content that's marked, thank be to God, by mercy all the way through. All of these C's, you can just pair with them. Mercy, God's mercy running through, and the gospel invitation running through. It's a curriculum of compassion. Love your enemies. Be merciful like your Father in heaven is merciful. It's a curriculum of compassion. It's just different than 98% of what you get in the world. You, you hear any of that stuff going on in today's political dialogue right now? <laughs> you, you hearing that on cable news by all the guys who make a lot of money by trying to get you upset all the time? No way. A curriculum of compassion founded on Christ's clear commands. But you know the way this works, right? Content leads into character. What kind of character are we molding? So let's go to that character. A disciple is not going to rise above his teacher in character. And a student is going to end up matching basically the character of his lead influencers. Character. You call his conscience too. And here's a question. Is the conscience calculating? Kind of like Satan calculates? Or is the conscience clear and clean? Jesus brings us back to this with the Beatitudes and the woes and with this talk about blind guides and bad trees. Character. Content leads to character. Christ follower's character. Compassion, again, is the key. You know when you're dealing with a, an actual Christian because that compassion just flows out of them. And they're just different. There's a light in the midst of the darkness with a real Christian, with somebody who's actually alive, born anew in the Holy Spirit. It's just different. Truthful now. We, we can go back and listen to my sermon last week. Moral boundaries and directions are still there, but it flows in compassion, right? Speaking the truth, but speaking the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. So Jesus calls us to active love, active mercy, active prayer, and active pardon of people who have wronged us because this is the way God our Father. If we want to say, Lord, may your will be done, okay. If you're going to pray it, be real about it. Pardon, be merciful. So, of course, most of us know the way this works, right? Content leads to character and character leads right into your conduct. So let's go to conduct next. Again, I have a reason for saying this. Now, I'm being re repetitive now, but I understand. But you've got to see the connections here. A disciple will not rise above his teacher in conduct either. Not just content and character, but in conduct. And everyone who is fully trained by the teacher will start to reflect the teacher in conduct. Is there coherence here? Is there consistency? 
Jesus says, how can you say to your brother, brother, let me cast out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see blepon, it's like basic seeing, the log that is in your own eye. You hypocrite, cast out first the log from your own eye, then you will see clearly diobleppes, it's like to see all the way through, okay, dia, all the way through, see all the way through to the speck that is in your brother's eye to cast it out. Now notice that that speck in your brother's eye needs to come out. But you need a teacher who is submitted and humble before the Lord to deal with your speck. Not somebody who's got a log in their own eye and they're so absorbed with themselves. You see the difference? So conduct to consequences. And then consequences, yep, flows right into the crop. Conduct, consequences, and the crop that comes out, right? A disciple will not rise above his teacher in consequences, or in other words, the crop, the fruit, and everyone fully trained will be like the teacher in consequences and the fruit that comes out of you. Jesus tracks back to something that runs all the way through the Bible. Good trees produce good fruit, it's guaranteed. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, okay? Rotten trees, you're gonna start getting rotten and bitter fruit. See this in marriages, you see this in families, you see this in business, you see it in schools, you see it in spiritual lives, right? So character leads to conduct, leads to consequences or the crop, the kind of fruit. And then Jesus gets to the jarring conclusion. We pretty much know the system up till now, but then Jesus says this, a crisis is gonna come to everyone. For most people, there will be one or more major crises in this life, and regardless, there will be the ultimate crisis at the judgment. And the question is, how are you gonna shake out? Jesus says, a disciple will not rise above his or her teacher in crisis, and everyone who's fully trained by a teacher will have the same result at the crisis. You better be very careful about whom you follow and watch how they handle crises. The crisis is coming for everyone, Jesus says, and here's the question. Will it, the crisis bring a catastrophe for you? I'm sorry, it's terminal. I'm sorry, it means bankruptcy. I'm sorry, the relationship is over. I'm sorry, we don't need you anymore. Will that bring catastrophe? Or the crowning confirmation that you're actually with God? Ultimately, what we're talking about with the crisis is, of course, standing at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ himself, the judgment. Let's take these in reverse order. Jesus says, the one who hears and does not do them, my words, the, the, the term there is poeo, it means to put it into practice. The one who hears my words but does not live by them, put them into practice, is like a person who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And the torrent burst against it, and immediately the house, it fell, and the ruin of that house was great, like into eternity, okay? But crowning confirmation, listen to this. Everyone who comes to me, Jesus says, come to me, hears my words and does them, puts them into practice, poeo, all the way through, like actually does what I say, actually re reframes their life, reframes their family patterns, reframes their household, who does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a person building a house who dug deeply, laid the foundation on the bedrock. And when a flood came, because Christians' floods are going to come. I mean, you're going to deal with crises. And if not in this life, certainly before the judgment seat of Christ, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. We'll talk about this part of the passage more next Sunday as we come to the communion table. But hear this. Here's the gospel invitation. Let me flip this around for you. Jesus is inviting you to come to himself and everyone who is fully trained by Jesus as the teacher will be like him. 
Isn't that awesome? You can be like Jesus. You can reflect his glory, his light. Jesus tells us this. He calls us to this way of being. Paul reflects this in his teaching. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Did you hear that? Learn from me as I learn from the ultimate Savior and teacher, Jesus. And then let's just fill in this from 1 Thessalonians. I'll give you the, the uh, prelude to this, and then we're going to look into be the beginning in the second half of verse 5 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, like Reed was talking about with Noah, with the children, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, into the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be. In other words, you could see our fruit. Do you hear that? You could see our character and our conduct. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of, here's your model, Christians. Here's your model, church. You became imitators of, fill in the blank there, us and, flowing from us, the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction. There's the flood, right? There's the flood. You received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So you became an example to all believers. Here's your good news. Everyone who is fully trained by Jesus will be like Jesus. It's our calling in the Great Commission. Go and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Parents, it's your call. It's your calling from the Lord. And here's the good news. 2 Corinthians 3.18 And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, becoming more and more like Jesus. Isn't this awesome? For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We'll come to his table next week, and we'll continue to learn what it means to be a Christian and to be in communion with him. I thank you for being with us today, and I invite you to give yourself this week to a serious examination of your priorities, who's leading you, who's leading your household, and a call to follow Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let's we hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.